there's a straightforward uh, connection between hydraulic necessity and political complexity. And uh, what that meant is that uh, historians like Wittfogel uh, claimed that uh, archaic despotic regimes were necessary for the functioning and the bureaucratic organization of large numbers of people and they needed a legitimating ideology and that ideology ter turned out to be expressed as religious myths, uh, generally polytheistic and uh, generally centered on the particular uh, uh, connection between a particular group of people and some specific deity or collection of deities. So what we're going to get here is uh, uh, a very neat, very tidy package that turns out to be empirically wrong. New developments in history and archaeology and uh, also in related disciplines which allow for things like uh, the dating of, uh, uh, of bones and similar organic matter. Um, what we have found is that the, what we thought was the beginning of history, as in the book History Begins at Sumer, in fact, um, is a relatively late development in human history. That large-scale social cooperation between human beings for the common endeavor of creating uh, stone monuments, enclosed sacred spaces um, that took an immense amount of labor to construct and maintain. These uh, ancient uh, sites, which appear to be ritual sites and uh, perhaps something like a gathering of clans, or it may also have something to do with masculinity because uh, there are a number of uh, statues and reliefs of animals, 100% of them are male. So we don't know quite what to make of that, but uh, the place I'm talking about is Gobekli Tepe, and it's about, uh, oh, 9,000 BC or so. And uh, it's in Eastern Turkey, and it uh, stretches back the beginning of uh, large-scale social cooperation to uh, previously unimagined dates. Uh, you have to remember that this thing is very old, and we have some even, even older sites now at, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Bangkok Lutarla. That's about 200 uh, kilometers away, and there are a number of other sites of varying uh, degrees of uh, investigation and of varying uh, dates at this point. But it looks like Bukhuk Lutarla is uh, even more ancient than Gobekli Tepe. But as Gobekli Tepe is the best known, um, it's worth thinking about that just for a few minutes. A uh, couple of ideas here. Um, in the first place, um, Gobekli Tepe it was put together by hunter-gatherers. In other words, these people did not have sedentary life. They had not developed agriculture. They did not have domesticated animals. They did not have the wheel. They had fire, but they did not have pottery. They did not have metal. They did not have uh, much in the way of material culture, except for the fact that somehow a large number of hunter-gatherers seem to have come together for reasons that are not clear to put an immense amount of labor into creating something like a, an ancient temple. It may have had something to do with a, a kind of ancestor worship. And uh, what's inside it is... Uh, um, there are stone barriers that function like walls surrounding it. 
Sometimes they have stone benches by those walls. And uh, maybe they had a roof at the time, maybe they didn't. Uh, I'm, you know, it's not clear whether they were. But inside these sacred spaces were headless stone monuments. They had uh, human properties. They were wearing loincloths. They seemed to have uh, arms and wrists and hands going down their side. But there's no head, so they look like giant T, T shapes. Now, the largest of these is about 21 meters tall. And even the relatively small one, oh no, no, not 21 meters, sorry, seven meters tall. And uh, even the relatively small ones at half that size weighed tons and would have been an immensely difficult uh, thing to create and then to move to the ritual site at Gobekli Tepe, particularly because they did not have any draft animals. They also did not have the wheel. So they somehow dragged these things from the point, from the limestone quarry where they dug these things out and brought them to the, the ritual space. Uh, this would have required uh, very minimally hundreds of people working together. Now, when you stop and think about the fact that uh, Generally, uh, a hunting-gatherer band of nomadic uh, foragers, um, 20, 25, 30s, about as big as most of them get. They can get larger, they can get all the way to the Dunbar number of 150, but uh, most are not all that big. A couple of collect, uh, connected clans, perhaps, but hunter-gatherers, uh, can't get to be too numerous because uh, there's an optimal level given any environment for roughly the best way to, uh, the best, best subsistence strategy. So uh, what happens is it seems that somehow dozens at the very least of normally separate hunter-gatherer groups all decided to come together in the autumn of the year. They found this out using pollen analysis. And they all worked together to do this immense labor for reasons that are far from clear. Because outside of eastern Turkey, it's not clear that this happened anywhere else. Perhaps it did. But here we have what might well be described as civilization. It has the advantages of uh, uh, the division of labor in society. Uh, some will go and provide food for the workers. Uh, others will actually do the work of tearing these, these T-shaped idols um, out of the ground. Now, since they didn't have metal, what they had was flint rock, which is somewhat harder than limestone. And what they did was cut by rubbing flint across limestone to cut out these larger than life headless idols. What they were doing and why they were doing that is deeply mysterious. The problem is the evidence that's turned up is uh, Convincing. This isn't a hoax like, uh, I don't know, uh, the Shroud of Turin or the, uh, the donation of Constantine. Uh, instead, what we have here is uh, a groundbreaking archaeological site that indicates that civilized social cooperation was possible even for hunter-gatherers. And the level of social complexity that this implies suggests that there's a connection between uh, uh, Chateau Hayek, which is what Colvin uh, investigated, and uh, the Gobekli Tepe site, and of course, Bunkunklu Tarla, which seems to be even older than Gobekli Tepe. So as soon as the Ice Age, the last Ice Age ends, in Eastern Turkey, 
people are engaging in uh, activities which imply forms of social complexity that no one believed was possible. Everybody had to rewrite their understanding of archaic history. The reason why is because things like sculpture, things like a monumental architecture, religious ritual, uh, probably charismatic shamanic, uh, shum, uh, shamans who uh, uh, performed rituals, um, somehow maybe 25, maybe 30 or 40 uh, hunter-gatherer clans got together peacefully to feast because there's all kinds of animal bones, particularly antelopes scattered around. And they also seem to have been uh, fermenting fruit in stone vats that they also dug out. Millions of hours of labor went into producing this immense structure or set of structures at Gobekli Tepe. There are probably at least another dozen such sites in eastern Turkey. What this means is that we have to rethink the origins of civilization. If you remember the old kind of Marxist materialist synthesis, history begins at Sumer. Dead wrong. Think about how old uh, Gobekli Tepe or uh, Bangkoklu Tarla are. More time separates the Gobekli Tepe, which was used for 1,500 years, more time separates them from the earliest Egyptian pyramid than, a, than separates the earliest Egyptian period, which is the steppe period at Saqqara, from us. In other words, it's about 4,500 years and it's about 6,500 years. So the, uh, the first pyramid would be on our half of the time. That gives you some sense of how old and archaic these ancient structures are. They have lots of, uh, of uh, sculptures and bas reliefs of dangerous animals associated with death and dying. Um, this may be a, some kind of ancestor cult where newly dead uh, uh, elders are sent away to the sky and they're going to be our intermediaries with the ancestors who apparently live on. Uh, they may have had the, uh, the custom of excarnation, which you find in, uh, sometime, uh, in, in occasionally in Persia and in Tibet, where uh, a body is eaten and taken away by vultures. Uh, they fly away to wherever it is that the soul goes and uh, they just rescue the head apparently in these uh, rituals and the head may well have been put on top of these giant headless uh, structures. So that may well have been the ritual which allowed the recently dead uh, to join the, uh, the immortal ancestors or something like that. It's not clear exactly what the details of this involve. There's uh, a problem with uh, the fact that they're all headless uh, there's an issue. Uh, they have different kinds of animals, but they're not the kind of animals that would ordinarily be prey for hunter-gatherers. They're last resort animals. Um, so most of the animals that are there are associated with pain and death. There are a lot of vultures. There are a lot of snakes, scorpions. Uh, these would not have been uh, usual uh, dinner items for hunter-gatherers, right? So uh, many of these, like the wild boar uh, or uh, wolves or foxes, they, uh, they may well have been uh, uh, totems for different clans or groups of, uh, of hunter-gatherer bands, and they may have gotten uh, various totemic animals in various locations, uh, there may have been some organization along those lines, and it may have been actually a, an ancient, something like an ancient chiefdom because of the widespread 
of these religious ritual sites, some of which, like Bangkok, Bangkok Lutarla, have residences in them, unlike Gobekli Tepe. But uh, the big picture is this. It was previously claimed that the economic base, which is in this case is agriculture in river valleys, um, demanded a certain kind of social structure, and that demanded an ideology which legitimated that social structure, and that's what ancient religion was. So ancient religion was an epiphenomenon that was eventually tacked on to a system of economic relations and exploitation on the basis of social class. It turns out that's just empirically wrong. And there's no way to rescue this idea. Um, first of all, um, the origin of widespread social cooperation and monumental architecture is not economics, it's religion. There is no biological imperative which demands that people stop what they're doing every fall and get together and build giant limestone monuments. <laughs> uh, if you could imagine, that would be quite counterintuitive. But here it seems that they do that, and they do that for generations. And uh, that means that they have found a, 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 a modus vivendi, a way of creating social uh, cooperation. And it also means that these hunter-gatherers must have had some kind of uh, mutually understandable language. My guess is that some sort of charismatic shaman would move from hunter-gatherer band to hunter-gatherer band telling them when and where we're going to meet, reminding them that we're all going to feast there after we've done all this very hard labor. We're going to allow granddad who just died this year to join the ancestral spirits. And we're going to ferment wild fruit and we're all going to get intoxicated, which has to have been a, a great attraction in a world that had limited intoxicants. I've sometimes wondered if those, uh, uh, those T-shaped idols that are lacking a head, I sometimes wondered if they might not have been mushrooms as well. And if they did, then it's a question of whether these are psychoactive or not. But uh, it might be possible for them to figure it out. In other words, that's not just a conjecture. The same data that they use to gather pollen should be, and, and, and dated to a given time of the year should work for looking for mold spores, finding out what kind of mushroom it produces them, and seeing if they're hallucinogenic or not. So there's still much work to be done. Uh, five or between five and 10% of Gobekli Tepe has been excavated. Much more remains to be done. They've done uh, surface underground radar and they know that there's a whole bunch of these uh, associated areas and associated idols throughout the, uh, the entire mound, the, uh, the Gobekli Tepe, which means uh, Potbelly Hill. All right, so we now have a new kind of human activity. It's ritual, it's religion, and uh, it's not a kind of hunting magic. That's what we saw when we looked at cave paintings, all right? And I'd be glad to say that's the initial use of durable symbols. It's not the first use of symbols because there would have been things like dance, tattooing, face painting, singing, all of which are ephemeral. We're not going to have any data for that. But these archaic cave paintings seem to show a limited repertoire of topics. One was hunting magic. They put the, the kind of animal they intended to kill 
on the wall and perform some sort of ritual in the process of doing that. Some cave paintings show conflicts or encounters between the painters and other groups, and these have been known to show spears sticking out of animals and other human beings. So they may have been referring to intergroup warfare or conflict violence of some kind. And uh, the other things that it has is that it has female genitals, right, in a kind of rough, crude way, but the idea is this. It may have been some, re some, uh, some reference or some gesture to the replacement to the regeneration of the things to be killed through the hunting magic. In other words, we will kill one uh, boar or we will kill one deer, but uh, the kind of feminine principle of uh, life generation um, seems to be what they're gesturing at there. And it's not in all of these paintings, but it's in some of them. And a final thing is that there are many handprints on these ancient cave paintings, and that I think is a demand for recognition. It's what the, it's the uh, emotion that Hobbes called pride, and uh, it's a way of signing their work in an age that doesn't have signatures. So these are self-conscious people who want recognition for the lovely buffalo they've provided us with. Okay. Um, where does this leave us? Well, here's the deal. Uh, it seems that the origin of civilization is religion. Uh, Gobekli Tepe was not the answer to any economic problem. There was no exploitation of the workers possible because hunter-gatherers don't have private property and they don't split into workers and owners. They split into male and female. They split into old and young. But exploitation is a, a, is a suicidal counterproductive strategy for hunter-gatherers. So the economic base of foraging did not demand that they start scratching 20-foot idols out of limestone using rocks. Then they broke their backs moving these things to their final resting place. And then and only then could they present the shaman with granddad's uh, excarnated skull. This skull cult was founded by Colvin uh, in Chateau Hayuk, and it's probably also in, uh, in Bonkoklu Tarla. But uh, the head, the skull, as some kind of uh, uh, token of the deceased uh, elder seems to have some common currency throughout a surprisingly wide area. And that's why it's conceivable that they may have had more political organization than we had previously thought possible for people at this point. So my argument then is this, the sort, as a matter of empirical fact, Marx is 100% wrong. Religion was not an afterthought developed so that people could defend the exploitation of superstitious farmers. Exactly the opposite is true. These structures that we find in Gobekli Tepe, they had to be the product of voluntary choice. In other words, this was a spontaneous agreement between people, no doubt mediated by a, a set of uh, shaman, who had a, a tradition and a folklore which provided narratives which guided these people 
towards, com towards action in the direction of a common goal. It would have required hundreds of them, and keeping peace and keeping order would have been by no means easy. So these are especially sophisticated new structures. It means that Marx was 100% wrong. Economics is not the source of civilization. Religion is the source of civilization. After they had these monumental uh, ritual structures, Gobekli Tepe, many centuries after that, that's when they developed sedentary life based on agriculture. Colvin, in his wonderful book, notices the same thing at Chateau Hayek. He said, look, it's an unarguable fact based simply on the stratigraphy, the strata of the site. Before anybody here started doing any kind of agriculture or domesticating animals or doing any of the things that we expect of a sedentary civilization, what they did was uh, build monuments, or if not monuments, uh, memorials uh, that had something to do with the skulls of bulls. These Bucrania are found in uh, walls and in uh, flooring and in pictures, and uh, it may have been a male principle or a male symbol that would combine with the feminine qualities of nature. It's not clear. But what is clear is that f complex forms of social integration not only were possible, but existed long before uh, the division of labor in society, the exploitation uh, of the uh, workers by the extraction of surplus value. In other words, Marx got this 100% wrong. What that leaves us with is something like a, a more a chastened and not too radical Hegelianism. The contents of hu the human psyche matter, and they modify the information that they take in, and they also modify the process, the actual hardware of their brains in manipulating this information. So if you think about what it would be like to be an ancient hunter-gatherer, and during the fall, your clan joins these other clans in dragging these newly uh, scratched out statues to the, the, the ritual site, and then you know a shaman would come in this would perhaps be at night, all right? So you would have torchlight, you would get a much more uh, eerie feel out of it, make it a bit like the Elysian Mysteries. Um, we would place Grandad's skull on the uh, torso and limbs of the T-shaped idol. We would do whatever uh, ritual would be necessary. Uh, we would perform some kind of ceremony and uh, then, after we finish that, it would be a time for feasting. So we could all eat as much as we wanted because meat was plentiful. And we could get a rare treat. We would get rotting fermented fruit, perhaps apples or something like that. But it produces enough alcohol so that uh, it is uh, an intoxicant. And not just the people, also for various other uh, mammals. Um, the big picture is this. Um, we now have new information. This information suggests to us that the mental or psychic aspects and potentials of human beings are at least as important in the development of civilization as brute economic or material necessity. No doubt uh, there were advantages to finding a way to successfully reproduce for any group of people. But what I'm seeing at, uh, uh, at uh, Gobekli Tepe that's different from the hunting magic of, of uh, Stone Age cave painting is that here the animals are not uh, the focus of what's going on 
We are not trying to create hunting magic. Here something deeper and more important is going on. There's some sort of response to the cycle of life and death. All the animals there are frightening. They're not food friendly. And they're associated with quick death, like snakes. Right? They're associated with pain and fear. So it could be uh, something like an early intimation of the inevitable mortality of our species that uh, animates uh, people in new directions, trying to create new kinds of solace, new kinds of coherence in the world, and uh, establishing uh, some sort of connection, a conduit, from this world to the next is uh, seemingly a genuine imperative of the human psyche. It hasn't been around forever. It is a point at which it emerges. And we previously had no idea how early homo religiosus emerged. And homo economicus was always there but uh, religion is not a distant second to economics. Instead, sedentary life, agriculture, uh, 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 the domestication of crops and animals, um, these come after these religious structures are, are put together, which makes possible the normative integration of people who are going to be living together in sedentary societies and this already uh, existing set of religious stories will be turned in the direction of creating moral consensus. This will allow re peaceful, stable relations and at Jericho, for example, which is like 7000 BC, um, they grew very fast, and the advantage that uh, uh, agricultural sedentary life had was that once you got beyond a certain number, let's say, uh, let's say 150 or 200, that's the Dunbar number, once you get beyond that, the danger of raids, the danger of uh, violence, from surrounding hunter-gatherer bands uh, reduces to very little. The reason why is that you're such a big uh, corporate collection of people that it'd be much more dangerous for them to raid you and uh, they are likely to be overwhelmed in a battle of, uh, of uh, arms. So the advantage that, one of the most important advantages anyway, that sedentary agricultural life is going to have is that uh, you're going to get the, the re, you're going to be on the receiving end of of uh, violence from strangers relatively rarely yes the variety of food isn't as great but on the other hand that also means that the uh, standard deviation in the quality of the food is probably less rather compressed in an agricultural society uh, compared to hunter-gatherers who are going to have to eat carrion every once in a while. So, here's the big picture. Every time a scientific revolution happens, the rest of the arts and sciences, the rest of the humanities, has to be transformed because they have to ask new questions, get new answers. And as they do that, the actual architecture of their neurons and synapses is transformed. So everybody, or every, uh, every ad uh, adult or even you know, middle-aged child, um, adolescent, um, would know about these events that happen every autumn. The event would no doubt have some kind of name and people would be looking forward to whatever this festival was where they could uh, connect to the ancestors and uh, maybe they could reconnect with uh, 
friends or relatives that had gone and had separated and moved out. Uh, they must have had a good time feasting, and it would be a, one of the few times that they could get alcohol. And uh, for that reason, we have uh, here a voluntary community. Remember that there's no way for hunter-gatherers to coerce other hunter-gatherers to build the pyramids or build the Great Wall of China. And the reason why they can't do that is because in order to coerce other people, you need a military force. You just can't be one guy, no matter how heroic, because he goes to sleep and as Hobbes says, then he gets killed. So instead of that, we had, uh, coercion is gonna require an army or to be more less sanguine about it, it's gonna require a, a militia or a posse comitatus, right? So a bunch of people decided they've had it with some person's conduct. They all agree, let's go uh, uh, engage in violence against this person. Let's kill them because their conduct is unacceptable. Here's the point. Um, that means that the origin of these large collective cooperative endeavors has to be voluntary agreement. It can't be coerced because whatever it is you would use to coerce them with, that has to be the product of a voluntary agreement. This is why Hobbes didn't simply make all government the product of violence, because he had backed himself into an infinite regress and had to explain how the first cooperation happened that was going to be violently imposed. And the only way you can do that is by putting together a bunch of people willing to engage in this violence, but you can't impose that through violence. doesn't make sense. So uh, this would be an example of that uh, voluntary, spontaneous cooperation that anarchists like so much. Uh, it is real, but it's evanescent and it's unstable. It's a real thing, though. You just don't see it very often in history. Um, what uh, we're going to talk about next is uh, the... Uh, importance of these new scientific discoveries about the development of the brain and such. And uh, this will allow us to do for the current state of natural science what Adam Smith did or what Thucydides did with reference to the new scientific revolution or the new state of natural science as they found it. All right. And uh, the idea here is that I want to continue what McNeil so brilliantly did, connecting the social sciences and the natural sciences, allowing for the genuine differences between uh, people and electrons or people and amoebas. Still, uh, they can't be entirely uh, disjointed or disconnected from the facts of nature, because we are only too mortal and only too frail. And uh, it's, uh, it'll do no good to try and reassure ourselves that we're not part of nature. Of course we are. We have a certain amount of wiggle room, but that's all it is. So it turns out that uh, uh, history may disclose to us that uh, funerals are socially constructed but regrettably, uh, there's no way that death itself is socially constructed. That's going to happen whether you're socially constructed or not. That shows uh, that there's a dividing line between things that, w that are in the control of individuals or society and things that aren't. Uh, I'll talk more about my uh, evaluation of uh, the current state of historiography uh, Particularly, um, I had some things to say about uh, McNeil, but also about uh, Harari, and also about a, a new book that's gotten quite a bit of attention. It's called The History of Everything by Graeber and, and Wengro. And uh, I thought these books ha all have deficiencies, but I thought in particular that the Graeber and, Re and Wengro was... Uh, was a, a difficult read because so much of what's uh, what's being presented there is uh, uh, dubious, to say the least. 
uh, I'll talk to you next about that.